The following episode of Charlotte, a City of International Success is brought to you by Central Piedmont Community College and viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Maha Gingrich. Coming up on Charlotte, a City of International Success, I will interview Mr. Klaus Becker and we're going to talk about his journey all the way from Steel City, Germany to Charlotte, North Carolina. Stay with us. Welcome to Charlotte, a city of international success. I'm Dr. Maha Gingrich. Today our guest is Mr. Klaus Becker, and he's the president of Naira Steel. Mr. Becker, welcome to our show. Welcome here in our home, Dr. Gingrich. It's a pleasure Thank to have you. you. Thank you, and it's a beautiful home, and thanks for really welcoming us here. You're from Germany, and uh, the, your story is really fascinating and also very inspiring. So to start with, where were you born in Germany? I was born in Germany in a small quaint town, Marburg, and it's about 50 miles north of Frankfurt. And it's quaint in the sense it's a student town, it was ah. never destroyed in the last wars, including it was not in destroyed during the 30-year war, 1618 to 1648. Wow. So it's attached to a steep mountain, on top of that is a castle. It's a very, very nice town, it has a Gothic church with two steeples, uh, Hindenburg, the famous politician, is buried yeah. there. And the other famous thing which happened there, I was baptized there. Uh -huh. And we moved to a city which is called Dortmund. I lived only in Marburg a year, so I was a baby. But I have still today an affinity to that town because we spent vacation there with my grandparents. And, and I have dragged many Americans through that town because I still love it so much. And they are always fascinated about it. <laughs> this is a charming old town. Lots of students, yeah. And it's yeah, very that's nice what it town. sounds like. It sounds yeah. simply beautiful. So you went to Dortmund? Now that is a steel town? Yes, let me a tell you a little bit at that time what Dortmund city was. Or something? You know, 150 miles north of Frankfurt is the so-called Ruhr Valley or Ruhr District. Mm -hmm. And it's about an assembly of communities like, uh, like Los Angeles. There are about 53, 54 communities you don't really feel when you go from one city to the other. Uh -huh. About nowadays five to six million people are living there, not unlike Los Angeles. Uh, on the eastern side where the Ruhr goes into the Rhine is Duisburg, on the eastern side, uh, I'm sorry, on the western side is Duisburg, on the eastern side is Dortmund. Dortmund had at that time about 650,000 inhabitants and was famous for the following. We had three large integrated steel mills, oh. which were pretty dirty. My mother had to take the laundry in from the balcony <laughs> when they, you know, had a, uh, we had 16 coal mines. Yeah. And Dortmund was famous for beer. Uh, we had eight breweries, and we were at that time the second largest beer producing town in the world after Milwaukee. Wow. So you could ask now, where do we stand today with Dortmund? No steel, no coal mines, and five breweries. That means you went to school there? Yes, I went and to uh, elementary school, high school. Is it the traditional, like most of the Euro uh, European cultures, their school system is like 13 years? Yes, you that's know, right. at thirteen yes, grades. Right. You know, I went four years to elementary school, and then I had nine years of. Actually, I had ten years because I had to repeat a class. I admit to that. Do you also do apprenticeship? Um, you, it was how, at that time that not work? usually. I mean, you know, okay. in, it's a famous German apprenticeship, you know, which comes from the medieval ages. Right. You know, out of the guilds, a master was there who taught other ones, younger mm -hmm. ones, and. Um, and I decided something which was unusual at that time. Usually when you finished elementary school, eight years, or you came out of middle school, you were usually 15, 16, you, you engaged in an apprenticeship. And I, I did that, although I had, I want to say, although I had the high school degree, uh, and it was a very clever idea. At that time, most of the students thought, you know, you start immediately with your studies and you finish with a diploma, with a, with a master's, and then you have a job for life. And, we all know that this is not necessarily the case <laughs> nowadays anymore. Yeah. So no. I, I engaged an um, apprenticeship. Uh, I'm officially called, you know, that is very formal in Germany. You have to pass an examination at the Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm officially a an, an, an foreign trade merchant. And that okay. is my title. And then 
I, I had the opportunity to shorten that from three and a half years to one and a half years, so I was rushing through. Oh, wow. At the same time, you know, that was uh, also quite nice. In the evenings, I studied two languages, uh, um, business English and business French. And then in 70, in 74, I finished with the apprenticeship and I studied in Bochum, which is smack in the middle of the Ruhr Valley. You're talking about doing all this. What did your mom and uh, your father, what did they do? I come from a pretty simple background. My father was technician in a research department of um, integrated steel mill. My mother was a more intellectual and she was teacher, but she was not teaching because she said, I want to raise my two boys. I have one brother. Oh, okay. And younger, so she didn't older? work. He's younger, two years younger. younger. Okay. And um, my background is pretty normal, you know, I, un-international, uh, un-entrepreneurial, un-political, um, just hard-working Protestant people, you know. My mother was pretty strict, yes. Wow. You know, you come from a family that worked hard mm -hmm. to live, obviously, you know, two children. Um, then um, after, of course, you're going to college or apprenticeship. Yes, yeah, after the apprenticeship. You know, mm -hmm. and what did you do then? Did you take up a job? Because I always wonder when economically, when it is not feasible for the families, and how do we come up with the things, especially knowing where you are today, obviously there is some kind of entrepreneurship going on in your head. So what, what did you do after that? It's a good point which you're bringing up, and I'm sometimes I'm wondering about that too. I, I must have a strange <laughs> gene, you know, an international <laughs> gene. I was, yeah. in spite of that background, I was always interested in international things. Yeah, okay. I, I made that uh, that apprenticeship as an international merchant, as a you know, foreign trade merchant. I wrote my thesis about yeah. about uh, international steel trade, but ah. you know, I I also. I worked already when I was at high school. High school was not finished. I was 18 years and I worked in Italy in a hotel for six weeks. Or I worked during my studies. I worked in Dortmund with that company. My parents didn't pay one penny for my studies. I paid everything myself and I'm proud of that. I mm -hmm. taught a little bit in a little academy in the evening. I worked uh, during the vacation, uh, uh, the university vacations in the same company which gave me the opportunity of the apprenticeship. Yeah. I worked for them as Hirsch America in Atlanta, therefore I'm here ultimately. That was my own yeah. trip to America, 75. So you were working all the way through? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 76, 76, I worked in Brazil. I had an opportunity to work for the same company in Sao Paulo. Okay. And it was a great, great experience. You are obviously traveling somewhere. Yeah, I was. You know, you're traveling to all these countries. Who paid for it? The jobs, the trainee prop, uh, jobs, you know, were paid by the companies. But okay. I had another thing of international travel. I, I might not have mentioned that before. I, I was invited because I had a good grade when I finished the apprenticeship. And I was invited to become one of the junior chamber international. And that is an old guild, old uh, respected guild in Dortmund particularly. Uh, uh, the, the JCs, they're called here JCs, but in, in Germany they're very, very respected, almost like, like rotaries. Oh, wow. And they in, uh, invited me to become a member because of my good grades. Good grades, and, okay. And they, at that time I was an international guy, you know, and they didn't really want to go to Lausanne to the European conference or to <laughs> Antwerp. They sent me <laughs> as a student. And I was even in the Philippines, yeah, and uh, it's a World Congress helping, wow. helping to promote Berlin as in 81, I didn't, I lived already in the United States, so I didn't have the fruits out of my efforts, but I was in the Philippines to see to it that Berlin becomes the, the, the place of the World Congress in 81. Wonderful. So I traveled a lot so. and I, yeah, I had, Studies were not that important. Perhaps that's also a teaching, you know, that, that you want to have a little bit of fun, that you want to be self-providing, uh, that you don't want to... Uh, here in America it's of course more difficult because universities are much more expensive. They are free over there, but still you have to live, you want to have a little bit of fun, you have to eat, you have to buy a book or you have to drive a car. <laughs> no? How did you get to the United States? How did you come to the U.S.? Let me tell you that. I had a very, very nice boss when I worked 75. He was, I learned a lot of him, how you are as a boss, that you are fair. And yeah. I, I was not the guy who made the photocopies. I was after him. That was an organization of 25 people. I, as a student, I had a very special problem that I don't want to go into details yeah. right now, but it required that I uh, went, flew around and counted, because one customer was in trouble, 
And so he sent me to Wilmington, North Carolina. He sent me to Los Angeles. He sent me to Houston because he had to count that these people had bought from him mm -hmm. and they had now piles of plates. And I thought I had to be nicely dressed in, 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 the, in July <laughs> in that heat in Charleston and Wilmington. I had suit. to find it in the suit. <laughs> I was climbing on, on plates, uh, stacks, you know, and, and then, you know, all the inches, no? I'm millimeters something, but inches. Is that now five inches, is it seven eighths, is it three quarter? So I had to all make inventories of everything. And I was, after him, I traveled the most. I was three times in Houston. I was in Mexico. I was in Canada. I was in Los Angeles, oh, in San wow. Francisco. It was great. So he was a very nice person. I said, I have to work for that guy afterwards. When you're talking about traveling all, all these places, and you said this was in 70s? 75. OK, so my question to in America, you. Huh? Yeah, it was in a pre-internet time, pre-internet oh, sure. era. That's for sure. Okay, and if you're traveling, whether it is within the United States or to the countries that you are going, it wasn't easy because you have no way of communicating with them and uh, planning everything so that by the time you go there, everything is nicely organized. And obviously, that doesn't seem like that was the case. It was even worse than that, Dr. Greenwich. Yeah. You know, because Right now we were talking about the travels during my study time and, and I was pretty much in a civilized country like like the United States. Yeah. Now when I once had the job, which I took then in 79, yeah. and that was an interesting story too, how I got to the job, it was basically a handshake. And a handshake? It, a handshake. <laughs> I had a very, very good offer from the other company uh, uh, for which I worked as an apprentice. And I, I declined on them, although it was beautiful. I had chances to work in Paris, in Milano, in Mexico, in Tehran, in China. And I, this, my, my future boss convinced me so much that on a handshake, <laughs> I said, after 40 minutes of talking, I said, I come to you and I will be your, your assistant. And that was the reason. No contracts. Why, no contracts. No signed no contracts. No pension, <laughs> no German pension payments or thing like that. Oh my gosh, no benefits, no, no contracts, benefits, nothing. No, he, he paid for my flight and 10 days after You know my, that doesn't happen nowadays, so. The, the, over there, no. for sure not, you yeah. know. 10 days after my master's, I sat in the plane and I started my first job here. I never worked in Germany. Oh, and then okay. I, like a little dog, I walked after him, you know, because I was his assistant and yeah. he was for him, the, the, the good was just best enough, you know. Uh, so it's mentoring. Yeah, the mentor, the real tough mentor came in my life perhaps four or five months later okay. because I found that this was rather boring, being the assistant, opening doors and so on, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And then, then there was another guy who worked, who was one of the top bosses of the company. I didn't know him even, where I made my apprenticeship. That was Jürgen Koch is his name. Yeah. And he was a mentor and I don't know anybody s until today. I never met anybody who was thrown into more ice cold water than I. You know, I, I was suddenly yeah. manager of the international. Yeah. He sent me to India. I had to deal with Steel Authority of India, which is at that time India was incredibly bureaucratic. 1980, 1981, yeah. it didn't break open yet. That happened only during the 80s. And I had to deal with a governmental institution. He never thought that he should in invite me <laughs> there and we go together and, and shows me the ropes. Klaus, you go to India and don't come back. And tender business, which is also not really <laughs> negotiable, you know, and don't come back without an order. And I heard that more than one time. And then, you know, when that worked so pretty- So that, is that also trust level? You know, I mean, yeah. you don't have experience let me, let me and back. he's sending you yeah, to a country right. to right. make some major decisions, risk management, you know, allowing you to take risks and then allowing you to make decisions for the company that's going to completely affect the company's success or not. Let, let me tell you, I come back to something which you just said. Yeah. There was a time there was no internet and probably there are a couple right. of younger that's people right. listening right now, they cannot imagine that. <laughs> you could not call, not that we didn't have a cell phone. You know, I had, you know, I, there, my, my agent was jumping on me. He said, listen, Klaus, can you 10,000 tons, 20,000 tons, can you reduce the price by oh. $5? Yeah, 20, that's $100,000 reducing the price for 20,000 tons by $5 only. Okay, yeah. So I was very nervous, you know, sweating a lot. Yeah. And, and then I said, okay, I could not call. You could not go into your hotel room and call. You had to beg the reception in the evening and you had to say, please, please try to connect me with my, 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 my headquarters in, <laughs> yeah, in America. And sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. They called you at three o'clock. Here's your call, Mr. Becker, from, you know, and then you were sleepy. You know, as much as I say that he was a tough mentor, I had always the assurance, even if I did something stupid, I wouldn't do something stupid, but if I made a mistake and said, yeah. okay, $7 yeah. less instead of five, and I did it on my own back, he would have done, 
uh, stood behind me. That I, I had wow. this deep confidence, you know. Wow. Then That's he sent me just to continue with the with the saga here, you know. Then he sent me to to Algeria, which was already at that time a difficult wow. country, pre-civil war, but very difficult. And I had to deal there again with a with a um, government institution, the Société yeah. Nationale de Chirurgie. And same thing, French speaking. I was the only one in the company who spoke French, so he sent me there. That was my qualification of so selling you did many know hundred thousand some tons. languages. Yeah, you mm, did know that some was languages. always. I don't know. And I, I told think you it's about a big advantage of um, knowing the languages. So um, obviously, you gain your experience. Like they say, they just threw you to swim, right? You yeah, didn't know swimming. Me. Yes. And then just they and perhaps said, I would say with sharks, the international. Yeah. No, no, not sharks. No, no sharks. Yeah, just you know, they said, you know, here I'm going to throw you in the water, learn to swim. I was thrown in the water, and I think I was to a certain degree self-propelled because I had this international gene in me. Yeah, I'm you you have that yeah bit. you have that passion for and feeling things. for international mm -hmm. connections mm -hmm. and global thinking, mm -hmm. and um, you know when they think about uh, when you hear about steel industry, um, it sounds quite. I don't I don't mean to put you down, but it sounds kind of boring because then you're mm -hmm. thinking, okay, so steel, what does that mean? So what exactly were you doing in the steel industry? Can I divide that into two portions of the answer? Absolutely. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Uh, number one, I'm, I'm always, and we haven't said it yet, I, yeah. I buy steel abroad and I sell it in Mexico and in the United States. Okay. In the meantime, we are a small company, but pretty sexy in the international view because we are financing deals. Imagine that I'm German in America, I'm financing steel transactions between India and Italy, between UK and Portugal, between Taiwan, financing, yeah, not not selling. I'm just giving the money, they ship it, and then I get the money. Uh, but my main main purpose in life yeah. right now is professionally at least is is the import of steel products which come from China, India, Brazil, a lot comes from Italy, from mm. Germany, into Mexico and into the United States and within the United States uh, to Texas in the oil and gas industry. Mm. And I can tell you, I don't have a uh, a customer within 500 miles. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's not a local <laughs> business, for sure not. You know? <laughs> yeah. Wow. So when did you come to Charlotte? I mean, it was 79, so this year it will be 34 years. Wow. That was a very You're good almost place. a Charlottean. Yeah, except yeah. for my accent. I'm still working uh, on I my know. southern no, draw, you know. No, I don't think. I think that's unique for us, so we'll keep our accents. Uh, so, you know, coming to Charlotte, and then you obviously decided to establish your business here and uh, to work. And did you have partners before you started your um, Nairo Steel it at this point? It was not really a decision to, to start my own company. I because see. that beautiful company for which I really invested so much emotionally and so yeah. on, they went unfortunately bankrupt uh, in, um, in 83, you know, because the high interest rate uh, killed yeah. the company. Mm -hmm. And so it disappeared immediately. And there I was with a highly pregnant wife. And we just had built a house or oh, bought a house, you know, two months before, 90% oh. financed. Wow. Of course, I had for my bachelor times, I had a Jeep, which was, of course, not fully financed. I had a boat with 400 horsepower. You know, as a bachelor, you need a oh, boat wow. with 400 yeah. horsepower, but you don't finance it completely. And so suddenly you don't have a job and you, you, know, you get a letter from Immigration and Naturalization Services and they say, if you don't come up with a green card very quickly, and then the word deport comes. So it was oh. not a very funny situation. So if you say, wow. when you decided, I didn't decide you that. Didn't I was decide. kind of thrown into going on my own. And that was perhaps a stupid decision, but ultimately probably not so stupid the decision because five years we, we really suffered that like dogs. hard times. A lot of hard times. I mean, if uh, your company went bankrupt. I mean, not mine, eh? not mine. The right, company with for the which company I, you're working yeah, with. Right? And then so um, you have family, your wife is pregnant, and trying to make it all happen. So a lot of times when we go through that, it's hard for people to believe that they only see the roses that you have at this point, but it comes with thorns. At so that time, I didn't see any roses, and I even didn't see any thorns. I had just to think, you know, how do I put how bread and butter on the table of tomorrow morning? So yeah? what did you do? We somehow, I don't know exactly, we somehow miggled through, muggled through for five years. And then 
I, I always say an angel, and I'm not religious or so, but some, something came yeah. in an opportunity in 88, and we engaged into a joint venture with a Puerto Rican company, very crazy, and I couldn't tell you anymore how we got together. <laughs> and we, we started for the first time to have regular business, and, and I didn't speak Spanish, so I had to go to Puerto Rico. Every three weeks I went there, you know, say here, hello, <laughs> Don't you want to have my steel? And we exported, Emotion, yeah. we exported the steel. <laughs> really cold calling. And then another language, <laughs> uh, you know? And we, yeah. we, we sold steel from the United States to Puerto Rico. And then in 91, can I continue? In 91, a great opportunity uh, arose. Mm -hmm. Paul Shaw, you know, approached me, a good American friend. He was in that business for a long time. And he said, Klaus, we have to go into the super distributorship of stainless steel bars. Oh, I said, what I is see. that? And so on. I don't want to go into details here, but. Okay. We, we opened South Star Steel in 91, and that was a very, very interesting company. You know, it grew like hell. You know, it won wow. 1.7 uh, million in the first year. We tripled that to, to 5.4. We wow. doubled that to 11. We doubled I'm that sure to you received 22. lots of awards in the process. Uh, I have to yes. say that, yeah. Yes. Ernst Young made me Entrepreneur of the Year. Oh, the Chamber yes. made the same. And we were five, three times, I think, uh, three times in a row, we were the fastest growing company in, in the business wow. journal. It was very nice, very, oh, very nice. Even CNN had a feature on us. Yeah, it was a very nice time. That is super. So really from hard times, you stuck in there, continue to look for opportunities to make it and uh, not giving up. And that's where, you know, the opportunity was found with the partner. And then um, what did you do after that? After Let me that say company? Something. The, the international gene which we have created yeah. here that, that is, comes from somewhere. You know, I, I think you develop a brain because yeah. if you're in so much need and to, you know, how do I get the bread on the table? Mm -hmm. You develop a brain thinking, what else can I do? And you look for opportunities. That becomes your job. My job today is, you know, the, if the exchange rate changes a little bit, you know, I lose yeah. a country as a supplier. So I have to constantly reinvent the wheel. And you have to get used. That has to become your second nature to look for new opportunities. It's not like Walmart, you know, you buy, you sell, you buy, yeah. you sell a new country. You know, for, I have never bought in China. No, for the last mm -hmm. four years, I'm, I'm importing China. That's my, my main supplying country. It's, it's just the fruit of thinking of new new venues you stuck with the steel from the steel city all the way to where you are today stuck in that industry in different ways and went through ups and downs success you know you found success as well through hard work and innovative thinking so i really see this as no matter what field people are going to whether it is uh, you know uh, services or whether it is steel industry whatever but I think they, they need to have a basis of uh, either a character or I would say characteristics, so leadership qualities. So what did you learn from all this? You know, what I learned primarily because it was not given into my cradle, that right. you can learn everything. Huh? That, that's, mm. you know, that you have to be open minded, you can learn everything. Okay. I wasn't born as a leader, you know, and suddenly I have 70 people jumping around in the whole country. We had five warehouses. Yeah. You, know, you, you had to learn that. You have to really have the willing that you learn. And let me say, the learning is the second step. First, you have to have the will, and the will comes if your wife is hungry. I mean, my wife was never hungry, right? <laughs> yeah, but yeah, if yeah. you want to avoid that There's she's hungry, you know. <laughs> so you, you think about that, and yeah. you, you have the will, the will, and you have to have a vision. You know, and yeah. you have to put your goal high, in my opinion. You know, I put your goal high. Yeah, you know, okay. I, I really think so. And and that's very important. Yeah. That's perhaps the biggest thing I can tell a young person. Don't don't underestimate yourself. Have your dreams, especially if you come after out of high school or if yeah. you come out of college or out of CPCC. Yeah. Perhaps you don't want to jump on the first opportunity. Perhaps you want to do something what you always dreamt about, do something, you know, just live it out because afterwards you will not have this chance. Yeah. And then don't think that you want to have a, a, a little car. Think that you want to have a nice car. Think that you want to want to have a little bit more money than, than, than other people perhaps around you. That you have a life which uh, permits you, you know, to go on a heartbeat to Paris if you want, you know, with your wife. Put your goal high because yeah. what can happen is you don't reach it quite, but you have still a nice life. If you say, ah, yeah, you know, I just want to go ahead and I'm happy if I have that and that, and then. 
you're suddenly 50 years old, 55 years old, and say, oh, it's not so terrific, the life which I'm having. Yeah. Mo main thing is dream, live out your dreams. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't know anything. You said you were always in steel. I, I don't know anything else. Steel is the only thing. And so therefore, you know, I think the, the, the main thing I can say, have a, have a vision, have a big goal. Vision and a goal and set it very high. Set it high. Set it very high. And uh, when um, you're faced with challenges, continue to persist, persist your dream. And, right? and always stay straightforward. Always stay straightforward. There are some, some treacherous ditches right and left. You know, you want to be straightforward. You want to look in your eye. You want to look in the mirror. Also after five years. Wow. Or 10 years or 20 years. All these things that is primarily, I just see you as a person who has never given up, who has always you know, thought about new ways and uh, of achieving the dream, but not at the low level, but at the highest level. I don't know. And uh, I, don't know. I think it's a pleasure having you on our show. And thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Well, it was a great pleasure to have you here. It's a great pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. And thank you for watching Charlotte, a city of international success. I'm Dr. Maha Gingrich. Please join us again next time.